Hi guys, my name is Drew and I'm going to be walking you through the Lance 2075 today. Uh, we're going to start right up here, uh, right up front here with the loading and unloading procedure. Uh, so this is going to be your coupler. Uh, as it sits right now, this is actually in the locked position. Uh, what we're looking for in that locked position is full engagement of these two teeth uh, flush there into the frame. Now if we go ahead and pull this back, that's going to be the unlocked position there. And when we are loading and unloading, uh, well, uh, specifically loading, we're going to start in the unlocked position here. So from here, we're going to raise the jack up uh, three inches above our ball and drop. We're going to, of course, center, our, center ourselves underneath the coupler here. And then we're going to go ahead and lower that jack back down on top of that ball. Uh, once we are fully seated on that ball, we can then slide this forward, locking that coupler down. Again, making sure we do engage these uh, teeth there on either side of the frame. So once we are locked there, on the, uh, coupled onto the ball, we can then go ahead and raise the jack all the way back up to that resting position. Uh, from there, we can then uh, go ahead and, and put this secondary pin in here. What that's gonna do is keep that from uh, wiggling loose when you're going down the road. It's just a secondary uh, safety feature there. Uh, we are then gonna go ahead and cross these tow chain hooks underneath the coupler. It is state law in Texas that these do need to be crossed underneath the coupler, as well as, it, as well as it is against the law for these to make contact with the pavement at any given time. So uh, make sure they're crossed, make sure you have enough room to make your turns, but not so much room that these are gonna make contact with the pavement. Uh, riding right next to those tow chains, we want our emergency breakaway cable riding right next to them with a separate connection point onto the receiver. So you should have uh, three connection points on that receiver. Here we have your seven way pin. Uh, this is gonna give you full function to your vehicle's braking system, charging system, and lighting systems. Uh, this is going to plug directly into the uh, vehicle's bumper, uh, seven way receptacle there. When this is plugged into the bumper, uh, think of it at that point as one large vehicle. So for all intents and purposes, uh, it is one large vehicle at that point. Hopping up here to your Lippert Smart Jack. Uh, now this is gonna operate uh, very easily with up or down operation here, uh, denoted by the arrows. You also have a light uh, that can light your coupler down here in the event that you are loading and unloading after dark. Uh, or if you just need a point of reference to back up to it uh, again at nighttime. Uh, also, it does have a battery indicator, which is a great feature as well. Uh, and this is a smart jack. Uh, so it also has uh, automatic uh, hitch height memory. So you can set this to a place where you uh, set this up for the place that you are loading and unloading the uh, unit the most and have it uh, automatically recall uh, the height of your ball and drop. Uh, or you can also utilize the uh, auto retract feature that again, when you're loading it, uh, and once you have made contact with the ball, a uh, series of keystrokes here is going to uh, automatically bring that foot all the way, the, all the rest of the way up. Uh, so you're not uh, sitting here with your finger on the button. Uh, setting both of those up and utilizing both of those features are outlined here on this sticker on the side of the jack itself. Uh, in the event of a power loss situation, uh, you do have a manual drive uh, option here for the camper. That is going to be a three-quarter inch drive nut there. Uh, inside the camper, you're going to find a corresponding crank handle that will allow you to, again, operate this in the event of a power loss situation. So hopping back here to your propane tanks, you have three 20-pound propane tanks come standard with the unit. They are going to be full for you today. Uh, each one of these tanks has the service valve on the top, open and close. I find most people are somewhat familiar with these tanks. These are going to be the same variant uh, that you find on any gas grill. Uh, any two hooked up at any given time and then one kind of uh, in that auxiliary position. Separating the two tanks that are hooked up is going to be an automatic switchover propane regulator. Uh, so normal operation is going to be something like this. If, if you're going to directionalize this, uh, towards the tank that you initially want to draw off of. As long as we go ahead and open up this valve, uh, we're going to draw off of that tank. Now, if we were to then open up this valve, what that means is we're going to use the entirety of this tank, and once it's empty, it's gonna automatically switch over to this tank. Now, if we wanna keep that from happening, which, which is 
is a very realistic option. You may not uh, want to use both of these tanks. You may want to use one and then uh, manually switch over to the other. Uh, if you would like to operate it in that capacity, just go ahead and keep this secondary tank's valve closed. You can go ahead and deplete the first tank uh, and then your propane appliance may temporarily cease to work until you come out here and you manually switch this over to the secondary tank and then open up this secondary valve as well. Uh, you also have a flow indicator here in the center of that regulator. It's a pinwheel style indicator, so if we switch to a tank that we have that service valve open, it's gonna indicate to green. Uh, if we were to, to run out of propane with this tank, uh, it's going to kind of pinwheel over to red. So it is gonna it's not gonna tell you how much propane you have, but it is gonna tell you that you do have some propane uh, flowing through the system. This whole area is gonna be covered by this propane cover here on the floor that's gonna protect it from any weather or rocks or things like that. Uh, that does just sit over top of these tanks and is going to, to ride in these tracks here. Of course, then you just latch that down uh, to secure it. Uh, there is an access panel on the top of that cover, uh, so you don't need to fully remove it anytime you are turning these valves on and off, only when you are uh, going to pull those out for service. So uh, that little black circle here, it looks like it could accommodate a key, but it is actually just a uh, latched where you could stick a coin in there or a backside of a key, and you're just going to rotate it into that secondary position, and that's going to allow that to come off uh, again so you can access these service valves on these tanks. Uh, coming around here to the side, uh, we have uh, your battery compartment here. Now, your battery bank in this particular unit is made up of two Group 24 deep cycle batteries. Uh, so you're going to have this same exact door on the other side. So what we have here is one, again, one Group 24 Interstate deep cycle battery. And you may need to kind of use some caution when bringing that out because it is a tight fit here with these straps. Uh, so if we unstrap it there, uh, we're going to uh, see these two vent panels. Now it's very important for us to get on a 90 day maintenance schedule with these lead acid batteries. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, physically pull these vent panels off and we're going to inspect the water level. So you're gonna see a clear marked water level and we do just wanna maintain that water level. Uh, easiest way again to maintain that water or the, the correct way to maintain that water level is going to be with distilled water. So keep that in mind. Keep a jug of distilled water with you. You will be topping these off on the, uh, generally in the hottest months of summer. Uh, when we are going down the road uh, or getting ready for travel, we want to make sure that these are buckled in, number one. So we're going to use this strap here and we're going to buckle them in. And that's going to keep them moving from up and up and down bouncing around in there. So we tighten that up. And then we want to make sure that we also um, have them locked here in the tray. So you have a little spring loaded latch there and we just want to make sure they're secure. That's going to keep them from bumping in here to the door and doing any damage to the compartment door. Uh, beside that, we have this uh, secondary compartment here. I think the designation for this is more or less for a generator uh, holding compartment. Uh, would work excellent for that, or just some, some, some run-of-the-mill storage. In this compartment, though, we do have your battery disconnect switch uh, at the rear of the compartment. You're going to utilize that battery disconnect switch for periods of long-term storage. Uh, so there's your switch there. And the easiest way to familiarize yourself with that is if you can physically remove the key that would be disconnected or isolated. If that key's locked in, you're going to be connected in, in, in that running position. Now, again, you're only going to use that battery disconnect for periods of long-term storage. Uh, anytime you're planning on using the unit, even if you're just driving down the road, you want that to be in that on position so those batteries will be maintained while going down the road. Uh, again, charging on the way to your destination. Uh, down low here, we got a couple things going on. Of course, this unit has power stabilizer jacks. Uh, they're going to be operated with the... Uh, the display on the inside, but you do have a manual drive option here in the event that of a power loss situation, this is gonna be a three quarter inch drive nut, uh, same as the stabilizer, as the, excuse me, the tongue jack up front, they're gonna share that three quarter inch drive. Uh, so just come down, make contact with the pavement, whether you're doing that manually or electronically, you're gonna come down, you're gonna make contact with the pavement and immediately stop. 
These are not designed for leveling. They are designed for stabilization. They're just to keep it from feeling like you're walking around on a couple tires. So leveling from front to back is going to be done with the main tongue jack up front. Leveling from the left to right is going to be done with the tires uh, and a leveling kit of your choice. Uh, right beside that, we have your Lippert Toy Lock. Uh, this is a really nice feature. Uh, what it is is essentially just a ratcheting cable lock that would allow you to secure any outdoor equipment that you may be carrying with the unit. Uh, it is a nice feature uh, to be able to secure that equipment. Uh, right beside that, we have this shallow little metal uh, compartment here. This is something they started to do uh, on the 2019 models, but it is a nice addition. It works well for uh, septic components a lot of times with the tube storage bumpers, and that's not really a case this particular model, but a lot of times uh, those elbows and those kind of secondary components to the septic system uh, don't really have a great storage place. Generally, that's what I would recommend for my customers to, to just go ahead and throw your gloves, your septic elbows, or, or anything in there. Uh, but really, it's up to you. Whatever you, you designate can, can ride in there uh, is safe to ride in there. Uh, we have your Blackwater holding tank here. Uh, now, what we have here is your standard bayonet style fitting. On this particular floor plan, they separate the gray and the black water tanks. Uh, and again, this is gonna be your black water tank. Now, black water is anything that comes from the toilet. Uh, so solid body waste is going to be held in this tank here. You have a standard blade X handle here on the front of that tank. To, to open that tank, it's just gonna be a six inch pull, in this case, towards the front of the camper. Now you're gonna to wanna to keep that black water tank in, or that black water handle in the closed position. You're gonna use the monitor panel on the inside and we're only gonna dump as necessary. So it is very important uh, because we have solid body waste in that tank that we keep it in as wet or flowing condition as we can. And of course, the only way to do that is with that, that, that valve in the closed position. Uh, you have what they call a bayonet style fitting here. Uh, what that means is you have four prongs along the outside of that uh, piping and then the cap or your sewage hose is going to lock on using those tabs. So you have, again, you have four, four uh, prongs uh, or studs on the outside of that pipe and then you have a keyhole on either your uh, sewage hose cap or your, or your, excuse me, your black water cap or your sewage hose and you're just going to put that keyhole in the halfway position give it a quarter turn that's going to go ahead and lock it on so easy enough just remember the same way your cap comes off is the same way your sewage hose is going to connect uh, that brings us to your tires uh, tire pressure and lug nuts uh, with this camper uh, tire pressure is going to be 65 psi now that's the max tire pressure rating that is stamped on the sidewall of the the sidewall of the tire as you would traditionally find it you also have a data tag that's going to outline that as well uh, 65 PSI is again the max tire pressure rating. Uh, with all trailers or campers, that's exactly where you wanna run that, the, the pressure is at the max. Uh, so 65 PSI is gonna be the magic number with that. Uh, also these lug nuts have been torqued to 100 foot pounds here in the shop. Uh, manufacturer recommends a retorque procedure. So as these wheels break in, it's very important that we do uh, recheck that torque. Uh, manufacturer recommends um, 15, 25, 50 and 100 miles of initial travel, it is very important that we do go ahead and retorque those lug nuts down to 100 foot pounds. Uh, manufacturer further recommends that at the start of each trip, there on after, it is very important that we again check and make sure they are maintaining that 100 foot pounds of torque. So if you don't currently own a torque wrench, it's of course not a bad time to buy. Uh, you will be using it through the life of the camper. Now, this box here, this is gonna hold your Thule uh, ladder assembly that's a telescopic ladder it's a really cool product it's new for Lance uh, because this unit does not have an exterior uh, built-in ladder they, they give you this uh, the reason why we have it on the outside of the camper here is because this is actually the place where you're going to utilize it so uh, it is going to rest on these black circles that is going to allow you to then uh, get on the roof now it is very important that uh, you you access that roof at the very least once every 90 days. Uh, reason being is because we're going to do a full, a full maintenance, uh, a full inspection and maintenance of the unit every 90 days. 
for the rooftop, what that means is uh, anytime, any place where two pieces come together, they're going to utilize some sort of sealant. Generally, what you find here on top of these lances is going to be uh, RV grade lap sealant uh, combined with a uh, butyl backed roof tape. Uh, it is very important that we inspect those and maintain them as necessary. If you see any degradation in those seals, we want to go ahead and replace them or uh, repair them as soon as we can. So uh, any degradation up there, we're going to either replace that roof tape or spot seal with those sealants. Uh, and we're going to be inspecting that every 90 days. Now on the body of the camper, again, we're going to be inspecting those seals. Anywhere where two, places, two pieces come together, they're going to generally utilize uh, either a butyl uh, sealant or a 100% silicone product. Uh, you will just have to inspect and see which product they're using. And again, uh, touch up as necessary. So uh, feel free to source those products wherever you can. But any RV or, or any RV parts house or dealership is going to carry those products. You can source those from us uh, or anybody on the road. Um, here we have our Truma vent. Not too terribly much that we need to talk about the Truma vent here. Uh, just don't restrict the flow, which the location of it would make it kind of hard to do so. Just let that breathe. That Truma is going to be your hot water heater uh, as well as your heat uh, for the unit. The actual location of the Truma system is here. Now, a couple things worth noting within this compartment. Number one is going to be how we go ahead and drain the unit. And we're going to be doing that uh, with this little valve here. Uh, maybe hard to see. It's going to be right there underneath that actual wood. So uh, if we, it's important for us to drain the Truma system anytime it is going to be in storage for more than seven days. Uh, reason being is because since it is a closed water system, we want to keep it as uh, we want to keep it as fresh as possible. And if the water is held within the unit for more than seven days, uh, it does start to to kind of go bad. Uh, so we're just going to turn that valve, and we're going to see some some water probably come here from the underside of the unit. So the water is going to drain there uh, from the underside. Uh, and again. It's important that we cut the inflow of water to the unit so it doesn't just uh, endlessly kind of drain. So if that makes sense. Uh, also, if we're doing a hard winterization process to the unit, uh, which I, we haven't really talked much about this thus far, but generally what that entails is uh, purging all the water from the system completely and then refilling those lines uh, and those appliances with, with an RV grade antifreeze. Uh, of course, being that this water heater and this Truma system is a closed system, we don't want to physically fill it with uh, RV grade antifreeze. So we're going to want to bypass that, which is essentially just cutting off the, in, the, the inlet and the outlet flow of water into the unit. So to do that, and this is going to be probably even harder to see here on the camera, uh, but you have a little valve here. So there's this tag that's going to give you the instructions. If we go ahead and reach further down, you're going to find a valve. We do just want to put that into the secondary position. Uh, that way uh, it would bypass the water heater uh, like we mentioned. Uh, biggest thing with that is, of course, when you're returning the unit back to service, we want to make sure that we unbypass that water heater so we can actually have water flowing into the unit. Uh, of course, it's very important that we do not want to start the unit uh, dry. Uh, if you are questioning whether or not you have water in the unit, you can turn that valve. Uh, like we did initially, that first valve, which is actually going to drain the unit. If it does start spitting water out, that is really your indicator that you do have water in here and you are, are clear for use. Uh, storage compartment here, uh, nothing too crazy. It is just a storage compartment. Uh, it does go kind of farther back there uh, to see the components here of the, the outside shower. So just keep sure, keep in mind that if you are storing anything up top here, we do have water lines back there. We don't want to do any damage to them. Uh, you also have a three quarter inch lug wrench. Uh, that three quarter inch is going to be a pretty common thread throughout the camper. Three quarter inch manual uh, stabilizer jacks, three quarter inch manual tongue jack, three quarter inch lug nuts, things like that. Uh, so the, the less tools you have to carry with the unit, the better. That three quarter inch common thread uh, is, a, is a really good selling point. So dropping down low here, we have your gray water holding tank. It's going to operate very similar to the black water holding tank, except for to, to dump that, it's going to be a six inch pull towards you. 
Uh, now, black, now, excuse me, now gray water is not, not as, uh, it's not essential for you to keep that in the closed position during use uh, because there is no solid waste there. Everything's gonna drain properly if, if left open. Uh, now, one thing to keep in mind is you do kind of want to uh, treat these very similar to like a vacuum lock where it's going to be my recommendation that you're not going to really want to uh, have both open at the same time. I know they're, they're quite far apart uh, and it may be a non-issue, but uh, you could potentially open yourself up to some cross-contamination or backfeeding issues like that. So just keep that in mind. We have your 30 amp, 110 volt power supply here. Now this is only gonna plug into the unit one way. So if we go ahead and look at this uh, plug, you have one L-shaped prong. As long as we uh, line that up with the corresponding prong, it's gonna plug straight in. Uh, once we've fully inserted that, we're gonna give it an eighth inch turn to the right here that locks it in. Then we do have a secondary collar here to screw down and lock it in further. Uh, it's going to be my number one recommendation with any unit that I deliver is that it is very important to go ahead and add a surge protector in line. Um, it's really the number one thing you can do to protect your, uh, your investment in your, in your uh, precious electronics within the unit. And this unit is chock full of those kind of high tech electronics. Uh, so again, definitely recommended that we do uh, protect it from lightning strikes or, or substandard wiring, things like that. And the only way to truly do that is with a surge protector. Uh, dropping down below here, we have your city water connection. That's gonna be used anytime you have access to full-time running water. Uh, city water is pressurized directly from the line. More often than not, it's overpressurized. These units are generally rated for a working water pressure between 40 and 75 PSI, so it's very important that we don't exceed that 75 PSI. We do include a water pressure regulator with the unit that's going to regulate that pressure in between 40 and 50 PSI. Uh, for whatever reason, that may not be enough pressure for you. Uh, make sure that if you upgrade to either an adjustable water pressure regulator or a high flow water pressure regulator, make sure, please, that we are not exceeding that 75 PSI rating. Those water pressure regulators generally are going to hook directly onto the water source. Your hose is going to hook directly onto the water pressure regulator. And then ultimately your hose is going to hook here to the trailer connection by rotating that trailer bound connection. Riding right next to that uh, city water connection is going to be this black, uh, very similar looking connection. Uh, definitely do not want to get these two confused. This one here is going to be a black tank flush. Now this corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank specifically designed to help blast off compounded toilet waste, body waste, things of that nature. Uh, it is a really nice feature, um, something you're going to want to utilize just about every time you take the unit out. Um, it's going to help keep your, keep your sensors uh, in nice clean shape, nice working order, as well as again keep that body waste from compounding on the toilet. Uh, there are limitations to the appliance though. There's no check valve within the tank to potentially keep it from overfilling, things like that. Uh, what I recommend, I recommend my customers a few different scenarios here when operating this black tank flush. Uh, number one would be in the event that you think that you might get sidetracked and forget that you have water rushing in here. If that's the case, we're gonna wanna keep that black water valve that we saw up front here. We're just gonna wanna keep that in the open position. Uh, we don't want to have there be any chance that it is going to overflow. Now, if, you, if, you, if you're confident that you're not going to forget uh, what you're doing here, you can go ahead and close that black water valve. And if you're by yourself, uh, give it no more than five minutes with water rushing in here before walking up front there and relieving that pressure on that uh, black water valve. Even uh, better scenarios, if you have a friend or a guest with you, uh, you can go ahead and hook your hose up to this. They can physically watch that monitor panel on the inside telling you uh, as it fills up. Once it reaches about two thirds full, go ahead and walk over there and go ahead and relieve that pressure on the valve. If left for an extended period of time, the path of least resistance, believe it or not, is the rooftop septic fence. Uh, so it will overflow that tank and that waste and that dirty water is then gonna, going to uh, come out on the roof. Uh, beside that, we have your uh, cable satellite inlets here. Uh, they are labeled. Some higher end campgrounds will offer a park cable service and just about every satellite provider these days is offering a satellite package geared towards RVers. Either way, these are standard RG6 cable fittings. 
These are going to be the inlets of those services and they will ultimately transition at the different uh, designated TV areas of the camper. So something to think about there. Uh, really nice feature to have, you know, a park cable service or an aftermarket satellite. Uh, again, these are just very basic pass-through connections. Uh, outside shower here, access to hot and cold water. Uh, very nice uh, addition. Uh, valves are turned here. You do have a hard on-off switch here on the head, uh, which is nice. It's going to help you conserve any hot, any, any, not only hot water, but just overall general water consumption. Uh, and this all does store in a nice, neat package here. This hose actually feeds into the cabinetry within the camper and its seats here. Uh, now, I have found that since people do not constantly see water coming out here from the head, that they have forgotten that they have these valves in the on position here. As you can see, that on-off switch is uh, direction is, is, is pointing towards the door. I've seen where if this isn't seated 100% correctly, uh, people will shut the door. It'll actually turn that hose on, uh, ultimately dumping water to the inside of the camper. So it's just something to uh, be aware of there. Might save you a headache down the road. Uh, here on the rear, um, you know, kind of a lot going on. We do have the rear awning. Uh, we'll get to kind of the operation of that on the inside. Uh, but we also have this large storage compartment here. Uh, and we also do have a smaller bumper storage compartment here. And I think this is more denoted again for like septic components, maybe your sewage hose, things like that. Uh, but you do have, again, a ton of storage here on the underside, which, which is awesome. Uh, it's just an epic storage, which is great. Um, magnetic hold opens on all these compartments, which is pretty standard. Uh, docking lights, awning, those switches we're gonna go ahead and get to on the inside. Uh, they're gonna be controlled at that one central location with that command panel. Uh, we have a little brackets here. You're gonna see these brackets kind of strategically placed along the camper. Uh, they're meant to utilize the Fearon Bluetooth speaker that comes with the unit. It's also a really cool feature. These do not have uh, exterior speakers uh, built in, as far as I know, built in speakers. So what it's nice is you can have that smaller uh, Bluetooth speaker. And again, you have different locations throughout the camper where you can mount that, charge it. It is very uh, cool. Now down low here, we're going to get eyes on these low point drains and it's, it's really kind of a peculiar location there and they're just right behind that actual axle so i don't know if that's showing up there on camera but you have a red line for hot water and a cold line uh, for cold water now that's going to be the point a to point b plumbing so uh, as we spoke of earlier manufacturer recommends that anytime the unit's going to be in storage for more than seven days it is very important that we purge the system of water uh, that's going to include the freshwater holding tank if it's been in use that's then going to be the low point drains, which are going to be by the axle first, or by the axle. That's going to drain all of the in-between plumbing, the point A. Uh, everything in between water source and fixture is going to be drained via those two, uh, those two lines there. Uh, lastly, we're going to finish up with the Truma system. That's just going to be that valve that we talked about uh, when we talked about that. Now, if we go ahead and do that, uh, then all of your uh, the water is going to be drained from the unit completely. So they were, we're good for storage. We would also be good uh, if we were then going to go one step further and do a winterization process. So uh, moving on uh, here, we have kind of the standard equipment. We have your RV style handrail. This locks in the extended position. Uh, from there, you can go ahead and fold it against the uh, camper for transit. Again, you have kind of the usual suspects as I call them which is a very basic uh, front step, which is going to bottom steps, going to front fold in first. And then uh, this slides in like so. Uh, definitely operates easier if you're in front of it and you're pulling it out evenly. If you kind of are doing it from the side like I initially was, it can actually bind um, and, and be slightly hard to get in. Uh, door hood open again. These are these are kind of very basic, usual suspects as I call them, uh, which are going to find those on any camper or RV. Uh, outside TV area here. Now you're going to utilize the TV mount inside. This is also a Lipper product. Uh, that secondary TV mount is designed to to uh, attach to a secondary TV, so something that you would carry with the unit. 
Uh, once that is paired with that, uh, once your TV is paired with that TV mount, it's just gonna slip on here and allow you to have a space outside where you can watch TV. Now with that mount, the top, the top is attached first, and then you'll have a little button on the bottom. If you push that button, that's gonna move that locking bar out of the way, just enough for you to kind of overcome this. Uh, once it is fully inserted, it's going to lock on. Uh, once we have that TV in inserted here, uh, we have different power sources. So if it's a 12 volt power, if it's a 12 volt TV, we can certainly power that with that 12 volt receptacle there. If it's a 110 volt P TV, we can power it with those uh, all weather 110 volt outlets there. Uh, also have a couple USBs here. So if you're charging any of your uh, charging phones or any other USB driven uh, appliances, we can charge those uh, via 12 volt uh, as well. So very nice there. Uh, again, we have another one of these uh, mounts for that Bluetooth speaker. Again, just so you can move that from location to location. Uh, awning, porch lights, things like that we're going to get to on the inside. Uh, but we have your refrigerator compartment here and you have a vent top and bottom here. Uh, now, not generally what we would consider a customer serviceable use unit. Uh, but it, there are a few recommendations that it does carry. Number one is give it a visual inspection a couple times a year. Uh, make sure nothing's gotten in. Make sure no insects are nesting or, or anything in there. Uh, mud daubers in particular are attracted to the smell of propane. So what often happens with these propane burning appliances is they'll actually uh, crawl up deep within the burn tubes of the appliances and make their dirt nest kind of as close to that flow of propane as they can. Uh, generally, that's going to leave the, the appliance inoperable, and it is very expensive once they have nested within the appliance to get them clear, cleaned out. Uh, so again, prevention is your number one key with this, and to prevent it, we're going to use a bug screening material, and we're going to screen off these vents top and bottom. Uh, to insert these vents, you're going to put the tabs down first, so you're going to make sure those tabs are engaged there on the bottom. Um, and then once we're fully seated, we're going to push these in, make sure everything is sitting nice and flush, and we're going to go ahead and turn these. Now, these should be relatively easy to turn, so if they're giving you a hard time, that generally means you're not seated properly. Uh, once you are locked in, just go ahead and give it a secondary pull. Make sure you are truly locked in. You don't want these falling off when you're going down the road. Uh, we have your potable water fill down below here. Uh, that's what we're going to fill that onboard holding tank. Uh, if we're doing any dry camping or going off grid, we're going to go, of course, use that holding tank. You're going to stick a drinking water hose directly into that orifice, fill it up to it overflows. But once you're full, go ahead and cap it off. Now you do need to use that onboard 12 volt water pump to go ahead and draw that water up to the fixture uh, and make it usable. So uh, that is a 12 volt water pump. We're going to get to the location of that switch to turn it on. That is also going to be ran uh, through the command center there and we'll get to that on the inside. Uh, dropping down low, we're going to see your fresh water, the, the actual fresh water holding tank here. Uh, as you, and you also have a very similar blade X valve here. Uh, denoted with a white handle, that means that it is clean, fresh drinking water. Uh, to open this, again, it's going to be a six inch pull towards the front of the camper. And when you drain it, it's all going to come here. Uh, that two and a half inch PVC elbow is going to take about a minute and a half to dump all of your fresh water holding tank. Uh, now again, just to kind of bring it full circle now that we've seen all of the components uh, to drain the unit, uh, for draining the, the, the unit of water, you're going to start here with your freshwater holding tank. You're going to pull that, drain that water here. We're then going to go be behind the axle. We're going to drain those low point drains. And then lastly, we're going to wrap up with the water heater. Again, if we do those three things, there should be 99.9% uh, .9 of the water uh, within the units going to be drained. That's how we want to store the unit, and that's also what we want to do for winterization. Uh, beside that, a little further up, we have a, a propane uh, quick connect fitting there. Now that is a quick connect fitting. Uh, this is going to tie into our propane uh, tanks up front. Uh, this is designed for any high flow propane appliance. So gas grills, propane fire pits, propane heaters, they can all utilize this fitting as long as they have the male uh, quick connect fitting on the other side. Uh, now you're going to insert that male end fully here. You're going to slide the locking collar back, insert that male end. Uh, once you are fully inserted, that's going to stop, uh, snap back and lock. 
Now you do have a valve here, and just like with any valve, if you're with the flow of propane, you're on, or with the flow, you're on, against the flow would be off. When you are on, you cannot connect or disconnect, so you do have to turn it off before removing that appliance there. Always make sure when you're going down the road, your desk cap is in place here. That's gonna keep any road debris from uh, making its way into that fitting. Uh, we have your compartment here, main storage compartment. Uh, does have this awesome tray. That does pull, pull full out, is fully removable. Say you go to the beach, you get some sand in here, you can pull that out, rinse it out so you're not carrying that with you. Uh, also make sure that when it is loaded up with gear that we're utilizing the bar latch here. That's gonna keep that from uh, slamming here into this compartment door and doing any damage there. Uh, also a really cool feature that Lance does is they include this uh, this card table. Now the table itself is nothing fancy, but the idea of having it uh, in, in the, the way that they choose to store it out of the way and make that, uh, that efficient uh, storage space uh, is just awesome. So especially if you were out here prepping a meal or something, you don't even have to pull it all the way out and set it up. You can literally just pull it out this far. If your gas grill's here, you can do everything you need to do right here. So it is a really really excellent, uh, simple addition that I just love that they do with the Lances. Uh, in this compartment, we're gonna see a couple lights. Uh, this tap light here, this, this main light is turned on and off by tapping on the, the uh, clear lens there. These, this switch below that's going to control the uh, LED lights that we saw on either side of the tongue. Those are beneficial, again, just to kind of light the way, or if, especially if you're doing any uh, maintenance after dark up here, it is gonna help make that a lot easier. Uh, other side of your battery bank here, now same rules apply here, make sure everything's strapped down correctly, make sure that you are fully engaged here with the latch. Uh, that's gonna keep everything nice and safe. And then we also have a solar plug here. So this is designed for a portable solar plug. This is an Anderson style solar plug. And again, it's designed for any of those briefcase folding portable sol uh, solar panels. Uh, which are an excellent addition. The biggest selling point of those portable systems is that you can actually park your unit in the shade so you're nice and comfortable. You can then uh, plug your portable solar panel into this port and then go ahead and pull that, uh, pull that panel out into the sun. Uh, that way you don't have to, uh, again, keep the unit, you can keep the unit out of the sun. Now this is essentially just a plug and play connection to the battery bank. There's really nothing that you generally have to do other than plugging it in here. Uh, your charge controller, which is generally built directly into the panel, is going to do all the work. That's essentially the brains behind the operation. It's going to take in energy as necessary, and it's going to cease to do so when it's not necessary. So it is really nice uh, to have that addition there. Now all lances do come pre-wired for solar on the roof, uh, but uh, again, not every scenario is going to call for a rooftop solar. Uh, in, this, in this scenario, uh, this kind of makes it a, a lot easier than having to, to park the unit uh, in the sun and you know, losing energy in that way. So, uh, One thing we neglected to talk about here, we're gonna back up a little bit, is gonna be your spare tire. Uh, now that spare tire is held in between the frame rails there. It, it utilizes a gravity uh, system there just like any pickup truck again this is going to utilize a three-quarter inch drive nut so that like I said that is a very common thread throughout the camper you can use any of the corresponding crank handles or the uh, lug wrench to, to go ahead and drop that down and it does have directions on how to do so here uh, on the on the uh, sticker on the side there so uh, that just about covers it here on the outside of the camper we're gonna go ahead and hop in and start going over those features on the inside so before we hop on the inside, talk, start talking about the features, what we're gonna have here is your first piece of safety equipment. It's gonna be your fire extinguisher. Uh, it is very important that we test all of your safety equipment before taking the unit out on the road. Uh, for this fire extinguisher in particular, you're going to push that green test tab down. If it goes ahead and springs back, uh, that means there's still life in the unit. Uh, if not, it's time to replace. So that's how you test your safety equipment. We're gonna hop on the inside, start going over these features. Great, so here on the inside, we're gonna start with these main uh, light uh, switch clusters here. Uh, now these are gonna be for, the two are gonna be for the awning lights. Now these are, uh, you know, kind of spring-loaded switches, so you do just have to touch it uh, and it does spring back for you. Now soffit light's gonna be on an actual physical uh, switch where you can, um, 
you know, there, there is a clear on off position. Same with the overhead lights here. Now this is just going to be the, uh, under cabinet lighting, which is a really cool, uh, you know, lighting of this back, uh, kind of area, which is nice. Uh, patio lights. These are going to be uh, different switches as well. So this is going to be a, a three-way switch. Uh, one direction is going to be a bright white LED. The middle is going to be off. And then the other position is going to be a amber colored, like less intrusive bug light. These docking lights, these are going to be the two bright white LEDs we saw on the rear of the camper. Uh, and you can kind of see those possibly reflecting there through the window. And then this entry light is just a light that you can hit uh, coming into the unit at dark, uh, to kind of light your way. So, uh, kind of flipping around here, we're going to see a couple things. We're going to see your in command center here, as well as your awning on off switches here. Now these awnings, uh, are going to, they will all run, uh, through the in command system here. So if we go ahead and push this button here, we're going to enter a passcode, uh, right now it's one, two, three, one, two, three, four. So you can uh, customize that code to your liking there. Let's see if I can actually get it in there. It's gonna take us here into this mode here. Uh, now here on the, the main mode screen, we of course have your water pump on off uh, switch there. And then it's also gonna give us a, vo a battery voltage reading as well. Uh, now if we come up here, we can look at the, the, the tank monitors here. So it's a little hard and it's not an exact science on level of full there, but you do have a bar indicator here that's going to indicate to you uh, the level of full. Now going through the settings, the actual modes here or what you're uh, controlling through the in command center. Uh, first up is gonna be HVAC uh, and we can just go on and off here. That's gonna be fan and then we can set your temperature up or down here. We can schedule uh, start and stop time, things like that. So you have full control over that air conditioning, uh, fan speed uh, is, is, is as well. If you go to either low or high with your fan speed here, uh, that fan's gonna run indefinitely until it actually, um, until it, so that fan will run indefinitely uh, even if it reaches that set temperature. Now, if we hit it into auto here, that's going to actually you know, run it more thermostatically controlled where it's going to reach a temperature and then, and then shut off. Uh, and then we have off there. So that's all going to be your air conditioner modes and that's controlled within that HVAC setting. Now, if we go back to that main display here, we have control over the lights and we're going to see some redundancy here because we have your uh, entry light, which is also controlled here on this panel, which you can also, excuse me, control on this panel here or from the switch. Uh, or your awning lights here as well. Uh, and they are labeled rear awning, uh, side awning. So uh, you have switches for those, but you can also control them through the panel here. Now, if I hit back one more time, we're gonna go to awnings. Now we can actually run the awnings in and out here on this panel uh, as well. Now it is very important that uh, you make sure your entry door is closed, uh, especially with this, I mean, essentially only with the uh, side awning because it can get caught on the top of that door or will get caught on top of the door. Of course, with the rear awning, uh, you know, does not matter, but it is clearly marked in and out here. You also have these switches here. Uh, now these are going to turn on the wind protection. So uh, these awnings are equipped with wind protection. If it gets gusty out, they're going to automatically retract. Uh, now that is an excellent feature. However, I would not allow that to, uh, you know, overtake good judgment. If you are if you are leaving the, the campground or the camp space, uh, go ahead and bring those in. Or if you're, if you're gonna be inside taking a nap or something, go ahead and bring them in. Uh, they're very expensive awnings. You don't wanna have them be damaged uh, if that, that wind protection uh, isn't working for us. Uh, we're also gonna control the uh, stabilizer jacks from right inside here. Uh, and again, they're, they're labeled with the, for their position on the camper. Uh, and you do have this in and out uh, switch here. Now, very important, uh, and, and this is something you would probably want to do with the door open uh, because you can hear it better. What we would ultimately be listening for, and again, I don't know if this is something that's going to, going to uh, you know, translate onto film well, but we're, we're listening for that motor to kind of wind up very high. Uh, that just tells us that that is a meet that is that has made contact with the pavement, and we need to stop immediately from, you know, from overwinding them or overstressing them because. Uh, we are just trying to stabilize the camper. We're not trying to do much else than that with those. Uh, and that's the in-command center there. Uh, not too terribly much 
Uh, other than that, of course, you do have a setting menu here. Uh, before you get in here and you start messing with the settings and, and uh, adjusting things, I encourage you to, to read the uh, service manual with this uh, and educate yourself to, to kind of have further control over things. Uh, here in the entry door, of course, you have this kind of uh, new age entry door design, which is really nice. Uh, you know, clear marks, lock and then unlock there. Um, awesome, awesome door. But you also have a built-in screen, which is really cool. Uh, and the windows all throughout the unit are going to be, you know, very similar with the, the pull-down shades uh, like here. So you have the pull-down shade. Uh, which is cool. You have the, the pull-up privacy, uh, and you can actually, you know, uh, unlatch these, uh, set a pitch for how high or how open you want the window, tighten up those struts there, then pull that down and you have a, a screen, uh, window screen, and that is, you know, for every window uh, throughout the unit. So it is a really, uh, again, a really cool feature. Uh, kind of moving, I guess, here into the dinette area. There's, there's quite a bit to talk about throughout the camper. Uh, each one of these cabinets is going to have under lighting. So if you pull those up, they're going to, uh, they're on a little pressure switch, which is, uh, again, you know, top, top, top notch design there. Um, you know, back here, but be, be uh, on the corner cushions here, you have a little bit of storage there. Which is again, it's a, it's a little thing, but it just is a very efficient use of space, uh, and you really can't uh, can't complain about more space. Uh, now this table here is also a this would this would make out a secondary sleeping area, um, and this is this is a multi-positional table. So you have a, a lock here that will allow you to slide it on this axis, uh, left or right, fairly easy. But if we are making this into a bed. Uh, we want to make sure that we um, we lock that down. And then I, oh, this axe, this, this. Um, so we make sure that we lock that down. We also can spin it here. Uh, but again, we want to really kind of center that uh, if we are making it into a bed. Uh, so we lock both of those down. And then we have a little gas strut here. So we would, again, with it centered here, we're going to pull that towards us. That's going to, we're gonna muscle this, this table down, which does take a fair amount of pressure there on the downward. Uh, once we reach that resting position, we're gonna let go of that. It's gonna stay in that depressed position. We're then gonna take this rear cushion here uh, and, and use that to, to fill out the bed. Uh, really cool dinette area. Uh, you know, this is the first time I've ever seen Lance do something like this. Uh, and it just is, is really, really cool feature. Um, you know, kind of again, the stuff we've already seen here in the dinette with the, the under lighting. You have a little uh, storage here for wine bottles, I'm guessing. Uh, they do have the cutouts there, which is just, just really, uh, you know, something I've never seen before, which is, is kind of cool. Um, you know, charging, sa uh, charging stations throughout the unit uh, was strategically located, uh, USB and 12 volts, uh, as well as 110 volt outlets here. Uh, up top here, we have your uh, Jensen units, CD, DVD, AM, FM radio, Bluetooth, all of those features uh, will communicate directly with the television. Uh, very straightforward in operation. Uh, again, going to carry its own service manual. So if you have any questions with that, either consult the manual or give us a call. Uh, we'd be happy to walk you through that. Uh, and then we have your Truma uh, system right next to that. Now, we talked about that on the outside, but uh, this is the actual display of that, and this is going to be where you uh, control the um, the heat in the unit as well as your hot water. So um, we have it heating water right now. So when you're using this, what's currently being ran is going to display here in the uh, top third or top qu uh, quarter of the unit there. Uh, and then this kind of operates like an old uh, Blackberry wood where you have one kind of turnstile here that's going to switch in between your modes and then you're going to confirm that uh, by pressing that button and then you have a back button to take you back to the main menu. Uh, so this is going to be the default display or the screensaver. This is going to indicate that we're plugged in and then again the time uh, and, and whatever sources we're running. So this is indicating right now that we are heating water on electricity. Uh, so if I hit that center button again, that's going to take us into the, the kind of main features of the unit. Uh, this first up, that's going to be your thermostat. So if I go ahead and turn that on, it's in the off position now. If I go ahead and turn this to a designated temperature, 
Once I reach there, I go ahead and confirm that. Then I'm uh, actually going to start heating the unit. Uh, it's not going to really do much until I scroll over here to fan speed and then I tell it what fan speed I like. You have two options, kind of economy or, um, you know, high fan. Uh, in this case, I guess we'll, we'll confirm high fan. Uh, and then if I go one over from that little coach there, uh, it's going to be the hot water. And you have options there. You have, of course, eco as well. You have hot and then you have boost. Now, uh, of course, uh, eco and, and hot are pretty self-explanatory. But boost, what boost is going to do is it's going to put all available power into heating as much water as you can. So if you're like taking back-to-back -back showers or something like that, you may opt for this boost mode. It's going to put all available power into heating water uh, once it has satisfied that that need for water it's going to then start running the the furnace again uh, and then if i go one over that's going to be our sources you have a couple options there you have standalone gas you have mix one and two which is going to use a um, on mix one it's going to focus on low power consumption so low energy consumption mixed in with propane gas mix two is going to be high high energy consumption uh, again mixed with propane gas and then you have electric one or two, which is, again, just high or low energy consumption uh, in this scenario without the, the uh, help of propane gas there. Uh, and then lastly is the fan speed we talked about. Uh, this one here is going to be if you want to set a timer. So you can set this to come on and off at designated times. That's if we want to set the display uh, time there. And then we have the settings. As with the in command center, before you get here into the settings and you start poking around with that, uh, it's definitely going to be my recommendation that you uh, educate yourself uh, with that service manual. Make sure uh, you're doing everything correctly. So I'm just going to go through here and kind of turn everything back off uh, since we're not going to be using it. And then so off there. And now uh, once we go back to the, the screensaver, there's nothing here in this top display. That means that everything is off and you're, you're in standby mode there. Uh, right above my head here, we have your smoke alarm. Now, this is part of your safety equipment. It's very important that we test all of our safety equipment uh, every time we take the unit out. So, 9-volt smoke alarm, just like you're going to find at home. Uh, make sure you have a spare battery with the unit. Uh, make sure you test it before going down the road. It's going to function again very much like uh, the smoke alarm at home. Uh, we have the hike event right above this dinette. I can only imagine that on a, a nice, beautiful, sunny day that this is going to light up this area uh, with a bunch of natural light. Uh, which would be amazing. So uh, you, of course, have uh, the, the handle here. So you have this, this safety button here that's going to keep everything locked down when you go down the road. It is very important that we do remember to uh, return that to the lock position when we're not using it. And then you just pull towards you. You have different, you have, you know, options when it comes to opening it. So three positions there. So that's going to be the, the uh, open the least amount and then a little bit further than that and then full open is going to be all the way back here uh, screen option there keep all the bugs out uh, and then you have your uh, privacy option to keep that natural light out if you choose to do so but again before going down the road we do need to make sure we close this fully uh, make sure it's not going to get ripped off it's very very extremely expensive uh, vent so something you you for sure want to want to do um, you know, cabinetry here, uh, nothing too, too out of the, the ordinary here other than with the, the way that these drawers open. I think that's cool. They're different than what you would normally see. Uh, we have the charging docking station for your Fearon Bluetooth speaker. Uh, we talked about that, referenced that throughout the camper. Uh, this is where it's going to charge uh, and be used here on the inside. Uh, TV here, you're going to want to pay attention to this black ribbon here. That's going to unlock it from its space here. Uh, so if we go ahead and pull that ribbon, that's going to unlatch it. We can go ahead and pull this out, uh, directionalize it uh, to, to wherever we are within the camper. Uh, that's going to run just like any other TV you've ever used. Uh, but it is a 12-volt TV, so you do have access to it off-grid. Uh, what we're going to be focusing on is these connections here. So we have your uh, antenna booster plate here. Now... Uh, if we were utilizing the park cable service or the, the, the uh, inlets there on the outside, uh, it would be in this position. So no green light here. That means that that park cable service is going to have a pathway to bleed through, uh, and there's not going to be any issues with that. Now, if we want to use the rooftop King Jack antenna, we're going to have to turn that on here. So we do go ahead and turn this on. 
gonna turn that stereo off. So we do go ahead and turn this on here. Uh, from there, as long as we see that green light, you can see uh, it's actually turning that antenna on there. Uh, now with that green light on, we're gonna come jump up here to the actual antenna. Uh, now you see you have an on off switch here on the actual antenna. What that's doing is, is it's not cutting power to the unit, but it is just turning the signal indicator. So if you had a guest here sleeping in this, uh, dinette area, they would probably almost certainly find these lights intrusive. Um, so it's nice to have the option to be able to turn them off. Uh, from there, uh, we go ahead and we directionalize here. Uh, this is an always up antenna, so there is no travel position. What I would be doing here is, is watching the signal indicator uh, to find a place where I have kind of the, the best signal or the more lights. Once I find uh, the, the best case scenario here on the signal indicator, I'm gonna go through the TV menu and I'm gonna do a channel search and it's gonna bring in the best options of digital over the air, uh, the best options for that digital over the air programming. Um, so if we don't, if we wanna cut power to this completely, make sure we turn that booster off. You have, uh, beside that, you have an HDMI plug uh, that is essentially just a, this is just a hub that is connecting the stereo to the television via an HDMI arc. Uh, and this would also be uh, where you would uh, plug in like a satellite receiver and things like that. Uh, and then lastly, we have a couple 110 volt all weather outlets in case in the event somewhere down the road that you want to uh, no longer utilize a 12 volt TV, you can of course uh, add a 110 volt TV to there as well. Uh, cooktop here, uh, you know, nothing too, too out of the realm or crazy. Uh, does have a little piezo igniter, so you would turn to the flame here, push that down uh, like you're lighting a pile of light, and then you could go ahead and, and actuate that igniter there. Uh, again, uh, very kind of basic style camp stove. Uh, once you are uh, through cooking, make sure you give it ample time before you cool, uh, ample, time, ample time to cool down before shutting this tempered glass lid. Uh, I have heard of these, these overheating actually cracking. Um, sink here, you get your pull down sprayer modes there, different modes, different spray options, as well as uh, that pull down, which is nice. Uh, again, ca cabinet with this backlighting, uh, pressure switch, uh, standard kind of run of the mill microwave here. Uh, very similar to what you have at home, although it does not have a turntable. It functions uh, just as good without one. Uh, but controls are going to be uh, what you are generally used to with, with any uh, microwave. Main GFI receptacle here. Now, uh, all these receptacles in this unit are on the same circuit. If one of them gets overloaded, they all follow suit. Uh, this is actually going to be your reset point here. So uh, if that green light's on, that means that everything is in good working order. If it's off, that means that no, you're not gonna have access to any of your receptacles. Uh, you know, pull out cabinets here. You're going to find soft closed drawers throughout the unit. Uh, we have your uh, second piece of safety equipment there. That's going to be your carbon monoxide LP leak detector. That does have a test button on it. We are going to test that every time before we take the unit out. Uh, it's going to indicate to you which one of those gases it is sensing in case of a leak. Uh, color coded here with, the, with lights and a series of beeps. Uh, beside that, we have your fuse panel breaker box. Everything here on the left is going to be a replaceable auto, automotive blade style fuse. Uh, of course, my recommendation that you carry a spare with you, a few spares with you in the event that you need them. Everything here on the right is going to be a uh, resettable uh, 110 volt light switch style breaker, very similar to what you're going to find in your breaker box at home. Uh, coming up top here, we got some light switches, cabinet lighting is going to be the under cabinet lights there. Uh, soffit lights are going to be the ones there above my head. And this 12 volt switch here, now this is going to work with the refrigerator. So this is a three way refrigerator, it runs on 110 volt electricity, it runs on 12 volt uh, DC electricity, as well as propane gas. Now when I turn on this display, so this is your on, the only physical button on the unit is the power button there. So we hold that for three seconds, that's actually going to power on, boot up, uh, and then go into the last save menu, or last save mode. So for us, that was auto AC. This is actually the most popular uh, mode to run these in. What that means is it's going to default to AC voltage if that's available. If for whatever reason AC voltage becomes interrupted at any given time, it's going to start to light on gas or try to light on gas. 
Um, that's again the most popular feature. It seems like the you know the way to cover all of your bases. If I hit that square one more time, and I, again I'm not sure if you pick that up, but to switch between my modes, I'm I'm hitting that uh, square on the actual touchscreen display. So that so that display there. If it goes to sleep, then I have to hit the actual physical button to kind of wake it back up. So next up is going to be AC standalone only. Now, if power gets interrupted here on this AC mode, it just stays interrupted. It's not going to do anything. It's just going to be not working. Uh, and then this this 12 volt mode here, and that's that's initially why I brought up the switch and the operation. Uh, as you can see, it's it's blinking. That displays it's lit up red here on the button, and it's blinking. Uh, the reason they do that is these. Ammonia absorption system refrigerators in general, they're kind of known to be pretty inefficient and very power hungry. Uh, they have their own set of limitations there on that 12 volt side. Uh, you know, Lance, all the manufacturers are, are aware of those limitations. Uh, and as a kind of secondary safety feature to keep you from in, inadvertently putting it into that 12 volt mode and like running your battery down or something like that, uh, they have this secondary switch that that switch needs to be on if we want to run it in 12 volt, now we can take a look at that display and it's it's running in 12 volt because we went ahead and, and hit that secondary switch. So uh, if you want to run it in 12 volt, uh, go ahead. It's kind of our opinion as a dealership uh, to, to uh, if you do use it on 12 volt, make sure you kind of know what you're doing, educate yourself in it, uh, kind of, you know, at your own risk kind of scenario there. Uh, you should be fine utilizing propane for most of your needs or AC voltage for, for again, most of your, your scenarios. Uh, and then that's going to be the last mode here on the display uh, denoted by the the little liquid droplet there. Uh, and, and I don't think we have the propane up front on. That's why it's actually not light. That's why it's blinking here indicating for us um, that it's, it's actually not, not lighting on propane. But... Uh, we would turn that display on, turn it back off, let it go through its lighting cycle again. Um, and, and, you know, as long as we've corrected that issue, it's going to light up just fine for us. Um, step in here into the bathroom. Uh, this is an awesome bathroom in terms of size in the camper world. This is, this is about all you could hope for. Um, it's just a ton of, ton of room, especially for a camper that doesn't have a slide out. Uh, shower is a fair fair size. Uh, you have up or down here control over the shower head. Uh, and then you also are going to have on off on the actual head. Now that's uh, to help you conserve hot water, things like that. Um, you can go ahead and turn that on and off uh, without changing your valves down here. Um, shower curtain is pretty straightforward. Uh, with this bow up here, it really kind of ex gives you the feeling that the shower is a lot bigger than it actually is. Um, so again, very, very cool stuff. Uh, switches here, you get your ceiling light uh, and then your vanity light as well. Um, I don't need to tell you how cool this sink is, uh, but again, it's a very, very much like a residential sink uh, in operation. We have a porcelain uh, pedal flush toilet here. It's gonna, going to be a light press to fill the bowl up with water and then a full press to flush. Now you always wanna keep some water in the bowl. That's gonna help keep those bad smells down. Uh, of course, we need to use RV grade toilet paper uh, and uh, chemical treatments, deodorizers, um, tissue dissolvers, things like that. Now, if you have any questions on which products to use, uh, feel free to go ahead and consult the, uh, give our parts department a call. Uh, they'd be happy to educate you on what you need to use there. Uh, now, when you're taking a shower, uh, it's going to be recommended that you go ahead and run uh, this fan here. Now, this fan actually runs on a remote. Uh, to actually give you full functions here. So we're, we're, we'll kind of come back to that at the very end once I dig that remote out of the box um, because I don't see it in here. So we'll make sure we have that remote and we'll kind of do a segment there uh, where you can actually see the functions uh, of that remote here on this uh, in the bathroom here. So come in here and to the bedroom area. Um, you know, of course you have these large oversized windows. And, and again, this is just a, uh, even blows me away how beautiful this camper is. Um, starting right up front here, we have uh, these, these little lights. These, now these don't have physical buttons on them. Uh, they are kind of just statically controlled. Uh, you have a little blue light there. Uh, again, kind of like a mood light or, or tells you where the switch is. Uh, and then you have, you know, uh, the light and the blue light. And then 
and I'm sorry I keep I'm multi pushing it multiple times, but that would be the all, all the way off position um, there. Uh, and then on either side of the bed, we have uh, a charging sta charging stations, as well as 110 volt uh, power as well. Um, I'm going to hop over there here in just a minute and talk about the switches, but uh, t secondary TV area here, which again is just, just really well done. Um, and, uh, you know, can accommodate uh, any style TV there, uh, which is fine. Uh, coming here onto this side, uh, we have your light switches here. Uh, that's going to control the backlighting there. Uh, and then this one's going to control the soffit lights above my head. And then we have a, another hike event here. Operation is going to be very same uh, as the one we saw on the front, uh, but it is it's just excellent. Um, you know, again, common themes, soft closed drawers, uh, hanging storage on either side of the bed there. Uh, we have these, these shades here. Uh, now these are, these actually go, you can see the little snaps here. These are going to go on the rooftop, uh, you know, fan vents and things like that, skylights. So of course the hike event has its own built in, which is, is going to be this one here. And, and uh, again, sorry to, to, to jump forward, but these are, these are mostly designed to, to control temperature. Uh, what they're going to do, what you're going to do is you're going to put these over those, uh, rooftop transitions. They're going to help keep the heat out and the cold in, uh, things like that. Um, storage underneath the bed, which again is just an extremely efficient use of space. Uh, something we like to see there. Uh, now some bits and bops here on the bed. Uh, we of course have all your service manuals here. Uh, let's see if I can kind of open this up and, and quickly find that remote for the uh, the fan. So you got all your TV and your stereo remotes there. Uh, and then I believe in this box here, we're going to find your remote for that fan. So, uh, when we actually look at this remote here, um, you have your on off power button here. And again, this is for the remote in the bathroom. So you have your power button here, you have your set fan speed here. So we can, you know, dial this down, uh, to, to, you know, 10% increments there with the speed. Uh, of the fan, or we can actually set a thermostat. It'll kick on and off to maintain that temperature uh, on the actual unit, or we can raise or lower the lid there. Uh, and, and really, it's just an awesome, awesome little setup. It does have a built-in rain sensor as well. So if you, for, excuse me, if you forget to go ahead and, and put that, that vent down uh, and it starts to rain, it's going to automatically shut down for you. Uh, you can mount this, of course, probably the, the location that makes the most sense would be within the bathroom, uh, but you have choice on, on where you uh, choose to mount that. Uh, also in this bag is going to be all your service manuals, all your pertinent information about the unit is going to be found here in this messenger bag. Uh, we also have your crank handle. Now I referenced this multiple times throughout the, the unit. This is a three quarter inch crank handle. You can use this for the manual drive of the stabilizer jacks, the manual drive of the tongue jack, the spare tire. Uh, all of those are going to go ahead and utilize this crank handle here. Uh, we also talked about this uh, TV mount. Uh, again, when utilizing this for the outside uh, TV area, we're going to put the top on first. We're then going to push this lower, lower button here that's going to allow us to overcome and slip over there on the bottom. Uh, again, this is going to be mounted to a TV when we use it. Uh, not sure if I mentioned this here on the outside, but it is very important that we do remove this before going down the road. So it is not meant to, to ride going down the road. Uh, and then we have your uh, Furon Bluetooth speaker here. We talked about the location of this. Use is very user friendly. Uh, and of course, you read the directions. Uh, if you have any questions, give us a call. Uh, I think we pretty well covered uh, the unit in general. I think we hit all of the uh, pertinent information. If you do have any questions or concerns, or maybe we missed something or you need some clarification, uh, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, again, I hope you enjoyed this walkthrough on the 2075. Thank you.